welcome to, the, to this panel about image builders. The alternative title would be I Image Builders Anonymous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm Zbyszek and I work in, uh, on Systemd and on KSI. But um, there's now lots of very interesting developments happening with different image builders in, in Fedora and in, in the, the projects themselves. But I think it's hard to wrap one's head around the differences, the approaches, uh, the strengths, the shortcomings, because I don't know, like I cannot spend uh, two weeks learning about Kiwi and then you know, figure out, oh, that's, that's the bits that are missing. So I thought it would be interesting to have this, this, this panel. We have some people working on each of the projects and I don't know, like let uh, me poke Kiwi and then you know, other people can poke MKSI and we'll see what, what happens. So, um, uh, this will be, uh, there's no, no agenda, uh, I have some initial questions. If you have questions that are uh, pertaining to the particular topic that, uh, that is being discussed, please raise a hand and then we can, if it's a short thing, we'll try to answer it uh, immediately. And if you have some bigger philosophical question then, or maybe a comment, then there will be plenty of time for that later. And um, so, Let's go uh, one by one, and please introduce yourself, uh, introduce the, the, the project you are working on, and you know, like two, three, four minutes about it. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Neil Gampa. I work on, well, what I'm here talking about is I work on the, the Kiwi uh, um, Appliance Image Builder project, which is part of the OpenSUSE project. Um, I also have previously worked on the Fedora Live CD tools. I, mean, I still work on it, but we're not talking about that today. Um, and I do, uh, and within the context of Kiwi, uh, I do a lot of work in supporting non-SUSE distributions in, in there, particularly around Debian Ubuntu and uh, Fedora, Red Hat, Magia, Open Mandriva, the, the, the RPM distributions that use DNF and as, as the package manager. Um, uh, hello, I'm Dan. Uh, I'm a systemd maintainer. I work at the Linux user space team at Meta. Uh, and I maintain systemd's uh, sister project for image building, which is MakeOSI. Um, to give a little bit of a, an introduction, uh, it was started in 2016 by Leonard Puddering to simplify uh, his, his testing and his hacking of systemd because he didn't want to break his laptop anymore <laughs> every time he installed systemd on his host system. So what I wanted to do was to build a Linux system in a file and then start it in a virtual machine, uh, boot it, and then if something goes wrong, you just throw it away and it's like nothing ever happened. So that's the initial use case for which it was started and Leonard used it for that like uh, for quite a few years. And then I came in and um, also started working on systemd. I noticed something's missing in MakeOSI. So I started contributing to it and now I've more or less taken over um, and we're expanding a bit to where the focus is still mainly on systemd development and any, any Linux user space project. So we focus on being able to build images very fast uh, and then boot them as well in a virtual machine or in a container. Um, and then there's various other people that are starting to contribute to, uh, for various reasons. So we built in RAMFS images and more distributions are starting to look into that. There is a sub project for doing Linux kernel development uh, same thing as systemd, uh, to be able to do it in a virtual machine and then throw it away. Uh, and, and various other things that people are using, on, uh, using it for. Uh, I guess the, the, the one last thing I would mention is that Leonard wrote like uh, this blog post a while ago, fitting everything together, which some of you may have read. Um, and MakeOSI is a part of making that story happen, specifically building the uh, trusted, very designed images that then can then be used for, uh, to fulfill Leonard's vision, really. Hi, I'm Jörg, I'm a university sysadmin, and I also work on MakeOSI. And I came to it at about the same time as Dan, and uh, I just stumbled over it because I was looking for something to do the work that, uh, that Bootstrap does and some related tools. And since I like using systemd, that's where I ended up with, and back then it was just so one gigantic Python file. It was pretty easy to hack on. So that's how I ended up there. And we use it for stuff like uh, 
images for HPC systems. So when you have a lot of nodes and you want to boot them, that's what I use Mac OS I for, and for installation and stuff like that. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Leas. I work at Red Hat on Image Builder, or the less generic name of the project is OS Build, which is both a, a tool you can use on a desktop computer to build images, or, and it's also like a, a service that Red Hat provides for customers. And um, it's a tool that both runs on and builds images for Fedora, CentOS, and uh, RHEL. And it's also the, the, one of the primary tools used to build cloud images for uh, marketplace cloud images for RHEL and uh, customized images for customers. And um, yeah, I guess that's it for intro and we can... So, uh, OS build is written because QA is Python mm -hmm. and KSI is, pretends to be Python, but actually, the large part is a system DD part, which is heavyweight <laughs> C. Uh, <laughs> and uh, OS build? So, OS build and image builder is a collection of multiple components. There's a core component written in Python, which is sort of an orchestrator, the, the, the worker core that builds the images and, and it con consists of a bunch of modules that do different, uh, various sort of like self-contained modules. And uh, OS Build itself is not really, it's an image building tool, but it doesn't really understand anything about images themselves. So there's higher level components that sort of define what, what an image, uh, the, OS Build is like a pipeline processor essentially. And there's higher level tools that define those pipelines and, and sort of uh, uh, create the instructions for OS build to to take a set of RPMs and instructions and output a bootable image. Mm -hmm. So, um, what are the biggest strengths of each of those projects uh, compared to well, to what we need and, and what other others do? Sorry, what was the last part of that you said? Like compared to the other, to the competition, so to speak, competition, and, <laughs> and to, 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 what, to what we need in, I don't know, Fedora and Drell and so on. So, um, <laughs> so what, what I think makes Kiwi uh, great is on, on top of it also being uh, uh, a tool that you can then run on your computer or in a build system or whatever, because it has high degrees of integrative integration hooks for build system infrastructure. Um, it, its main plus point is that it's designed for humans to be able to understand how an image is actually put together. It has a, a well-defined specification format for describing what you're going to include in an image and what the metadata for being described, what the purpose of an image is, and it can be valid. It can be verified and validated with a specification definition. So when you it, its primary format is XML. Yes, I know there's a whole thing about it. You could use other things like YAML or JSON. But one of the nice things about using it with XML is that there is a schema definition that it can then use to then, before you even execute any build steps, it can at least do basic verification, make sure you didn't fat finger something or that you didn't put a, a value that is invalid or, you, that, or any of those sorts of basic things that for a lot of image build tools that are out there, not necessarily these guys here, but a lot of image build tools out there don't do and then that fat finger or, or typo can result in spending minutes or hours waiting for something to tell you that you've screwed up. And, and maybe it never tells you and you just have a silent error or something. So being able to be loud in the beginning about, some, about basic errors and then giving you good logging and output that lets you see what goes on at the end. And then at the very end of the build, you have, ow. So the mic works. Yeah, the mic works, definitely. <laughs> the very end of the build, you get these, um, files in addition to the image artifact that you produce that gives you information about what's in it um, that you can use kind okay. of like SBOM type artifacts or, uh, or to be able to be able to identify the contents and changes based on from build to build, things like that which tend to be very useful for people to decide whether this is something useful or, or, or pipelines to decide whether there's something to, to warn about or whatever because it produces a mixture of human and machine readable data that you can leverage with. And I think that's a really good strength of Kiwi as a build tool. And I think that kind of speaks to its origins as 
folks at SUSE are building this as a component to be part of a larger infrastructure uh, while being independently composable for humans to also use in its own right. So um, what you said about, um, isn't this very loud now? I mean, it's okay. Uh, uh, failing early. This is because the declaration of what to do is declarative, right? I mean, yes. It's, it's a declaration, not a set of commands to execute one right. by one. Most of what you do in a, key, in a Kiwi image definition uh, or we call them image descriptions, that's our parlance, is it literally a, a declaration of, of, of information about what the image should have. And so you say, okay, this is the name of the image, this is what version it is, this is the, you know, this is the, the properties of the image that it should have, and this is the, the components you need to make sure are in the image uh, for the image, for it to be something that produces what you want. And then it works through and figures it out. So if, you, if you're used to declarative... Uh, declarative build infrastructure. This is similar in kind. I guess to pick up on that, probably we should have invited one more person who works with OCI container images and, and specifically Docker files. Oh. Because uh, that's a good example of, I guess, uh, uh, an image building tool that's imperative. Uh, you list the commands in a Docker file that you want to run sequentially, whereas I think for all the tools here, we, I think we're all declarative. We're all declarative. More so, or less. So you don't list the commands to run. You list uh, the packages to install. You list the output format you want uh, in a declarative way. And then I think almost all of us, I'm not sure, uh, also support hooks mm -hmm. to run whatever imperative stuff you want that isn't supported by the declarative right. uh, output format. Then uh, the strengths of MakeOSI, I would say... We're probably the best integrated with systemd of, out of all of them, given that we're in systemd <laughs> project. Uh, so we try to give the tool itself uh, minimal, and we try to delegate as much as we can to systemd. So anything, you don't have to learn too much about MakeOSI itself. You, for a lot of stuff, we just delegate to systemd. If you need to run stuff inside the image, whatever. So you just write systemd units, systemd preset files, uh, anything else you can think of. And also for the image building itself, we also delegate a lot to systemd. So um, that gets into the next point, which is that we're the only one that supports building not all types of images, but uh, disk images without needing root privileges. Uh, and as a sub or as a as a because of not needing root privileges, we also don't need loop devices. Because if you need loop devices, then you need root. So uh, we developed systemd repart, which is basically a declarative description of how to build a disk image. So you give, uh, you give it a directory, which contains the image in directory form. And then you can specify these files go to these partitions, uh, these files go to this partition. Uh, and systemd repart takes that, and it transforms that into a disk image without ever needing root privileges. And uh, that means you can run MakeOSI from a container uh, you can, without any device access available or without needing root privileges. Uh, two questions. Uh... <laughs> yeah, please. So then we have to repeat. So I just wanted to ask if, if um, uh, MKOSI or MakeOSI... Uh, make, yeah, MKOSI... <laughs> Uh, leverages the, the a package manager, or does it like when you say like it moves files from one place to another? Does it leverage a package manager, or, or just copies or moves? So we do we do use package managers for each of the supported distributions. So uh, we support every dis well every no not every distribution. No. We support every uh, package manager based. Not even we don't support Gentoo, but we support Ubuntu, uh, Debian, all the Fedora, uh, CentOS, whatever. OpenSUSE and Arch. And I uh, added Magia to it years ago. Yeah, and it's like there, there's a few more niche RPM-based distros that we also, uh, also support. But yeah, so we, we uh, use user namespaces to be able to run the package managers without root. Uh, but yeah, all the packaging is still delegated to the distribution. So we, we try to do uh, as the least amount possible after installing packages. You can, everything you want extra, you do yourself. But we, in MakeOSI, we try to do Instead of fixing something in MakeOSI, we try to fix it upstream in the distribution. So uh, maybe to clarify, uh, for example, for to, to install Fedora, uh, to, to, uh, to make a Fedora image, 
uh, MKSI will run DNF install root equals something, uh, and a list of packages specified by the user, and then this creates the, the contents in the sense of files, and then systemd repart is used to take those contents and produce an actual block device image from that. So it's, it's I mean, the, the, the amount of logic is minimal, and this means that like Magia, support for Magia means that you just have a, a file that defines what are the repo names and the URLs to download the repos from, essentially. I think for me, the thing that really sets MKOSI apart from all the others that I really love about it is that there's no kernel involved, and because kernels are messy things, and like you have you know stuff lying around in different threads, and how stuff ends up landing on the disk is pretty random because um, it's just at the whim of timing and stuff. Uh, have you as a team looked a lot into how reproducible, like in sense of deterministic, the builds are? Because you definitely have the ability there with that set of technical decisions that it could easily go in that direction. I don't know if that's a question for all of us or just you. I mean, if you want to jump in, then we can do that. Uh, so for reproducible builds, um, we, yeah, we ourselves haven't really done anything specifically with it, but there is a company that's using MakeOSI, uh, Edgeless Systems, which are trying to do confidential computing uh, related stuff with it. And they have put a lot of uh, effort into making specific types of images reproducible. So I think if you use uh, EROFS for the uh, slash user partition, and then you generate the root partition on first boot, uh, then you, get a you can get a reproducible output from uh, MakeOSI. Uh, the VFAT, uh, ESP, you can make reproducible if you do the right options, but Repart does it now. And then if, uh, if you go, for example, to X4 or something for the root partition and you do that in the image, I, have, I think there might be a way to make it reproducible, but we, um, with like various environment variables and such, but we haven't figured those out yet. Uh, but for, I don't think there's anything preventing in the, uh, the, for, from getting reproducible uh, images. Although the edgeless systems do run uh, MakeOSI in a Nix-based environment so that they can pin all the tools to the uh, exact versions to, to make sure things stay, stay the same. Um, yeah. um, maybe another strength of MakeOSI is we're very slim. So we have very few dependencies since System D repart does a lot of the work. Uh, we need that, and then we need we need Python, but that's uh, available everywhere. We need util Linux and core utils, and that's about it. And and MKOSI is pretty small itself too, and very easy to install. You can just git clone the, the repo and run it from there, and that's that's very nice. It's it's very hackable. I use it interactively often by just putting a shell in, in a build script and then hacking in the build environment interactively. That's, that's something I like about MakeOSI. So for us build, I think, uh, uh, I think one of the main benefits is sort of the, the, the description format like Neil said about Kiwi, like the, the manifests that, we, that, we, that OS build consumes to build. They're not very human friendly. <laughs> But, but they do sort of guarantee a sort of, we say functional reproducibility, which is kind of like a cop-out to say, it, 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 it'll do the same thing, but we can't guarantee sort of like bit by bit reproducibility. But it does, it, like OS build, the, there's a lot of effort put into OS build to isolate the host from whatever's going on. So we, we set up like an isolated build route, uh, like every image definition and every sort of like build will set up uh, a clean build route, um, and then and then every stage in a pipeline itself is uh, very simple and very targeted. It's very easy to reason about what will happen at each stage of the build process. Um, there's like very few dependencies, so like basically every stage transforms a tree in a very specific way. So it's kind of easy to trace what will happen and almost guarantee that if, if a build breaks on one system, you're gonna see the same failure on any other system. So there's very little interaction with the host, as much as possible, of course, like there's kernels that we don't isolate. Um, 
So that's, that's sort of like the, the, the I, th I think one of the greatest benefits of, of OS Build. And then there's, on top of that, like OS Build Composer, which defines the image types. Um, I think a great benefit of that is it's really difficult to generate, to tell it to build an image and get something that's unusable out of it. Like it's really stable. The downside of that, of course, is it doesn't give you a lot of options. So if you're working at the OS Build Composer level, you have very few knobs to to turn and, and, and play with to, to get something bad out of it. Um, now, I think, I think the biggest, in the interest of fairness, I think one of the downsides is like we have this, we have these two levels in the general image builder ecosystem, which is OS build, which like I said, is this kind of like stupid pipeline processor. And then we have OS build composer, which is like this uh, knower of all domain knowledge of what is a RHEL or a Fedora system. And OS Build Composer is, I think, is really great for like this a sysadmin type that just wants to like build build a customized image with a few options, like change your kernel options, add some packages, add some custom partitions, and all that. Um, but there's a lot of people in between, like us, distro maintainers, that want a lot more flexibility. That sort of falls between the two. Like they want. They want usability at a higher level than OS Build, but flexibility at a lower level than OS Build Composer. And that's not something we have. It's something we're very aware of and we're actually working on now. I don't know if I should be saying that. <laughs> um, well, I think that's the week. I mean, it's a, yeah, I mean that's, that's sort of like a lot of things. But yeah, I think it's a, a, a to go back to like um, the sort of like sandwich it with, a, with the thing. I think the, I, I, I don't think, I wouldn't underestimate the sort of like the, the, the strength and flexibility of OS build and, and sort of like the pipeline processing. For example, like we have image definitions for, I don't know, Fedora QCAS, you know, or Fedora. And it's not that difficult to pop out the RPM stage and plug in a Pac-Man stage and you'll probably get the equivalent arch image. Um, you might need to like fiddle with like bootloader options and stuff like that, but you can sort of like look at the pipeline and know, oh, this is this RPM stage is going to install these RPMs, and this FS tab stage is going to write an FS tab file with these options, and you can sort of, if you know how to read it, you can you look look at a manifest and sort of build it in your head. Maybe that's just me talking with all my experience with the tool, but yeah. Martin. Hello. Let me run up to you. Thanks. Yeah, during development, you often want to have this kind of rapid iteration cycle where you cache as much as you can from, like, let's say, FE bootstrap or downloading packages and so on. Like, the Docker files made this pretty easy. Like, you'd run DNF first, and then you add your config files and so on. Like, Container file, I'm sorry, swear job. <laughs> I mean, it was in a historic context. Anyway, um, so it seems like OS build seems very well suited to do this. You only execute the later stages of that build process. Like, can like MKOSI or Kiwi do this as well so that you can iterate this fast? So yes, um, to kind of put both of these, uh, you know, your question about the reproducible and actually your question about splitting the stages are interrelated from the context of Kiwi. So by default, we tell people to go through and run what we call the Kiwi system build command, which actually puts all the steps together and then runs them in order. This is specifically to make it so that the, the in and out forms are, are you know, process-wise reproducible. I'm not gonna say bit-wise reproducible because that's a whole separate kettle of fish, but we can do process-wise reproducibility provided that our inputs are stable and that, we, that you're executing the command correctly. But that like OS build, we can break the stages apart and you can run the stages independently. And then, so we have a prepare stage, we have a build stage, and we have a, fi and we have a bundle finalize stage. So the prepare stage sets up the root environment, sets up all the flags, puts the variables, and imports the GPG keys, all the works. The build stage then installs all the packages and then runs the config sh that has any extra imperative hook steps that you want. And then the, the bundle stage is what takes all that up and wraps it into the image and then puts it out into an archive that you can then redistribute um, with, all the, with all the logs and whatever. Um, when you break them apart in those ways, you can also see, you can also just step in and then step out. So you can step in and make some mutations, your own changes, look at something, and then step back out and run the next step. 
Um, by default, if you try to do this, um, Kiwi will actually throw an error saying that this root already exists or this environment already exists. But you can pass a flag to say, I already know that this exists. I want to run it inside this and keep going. We try very hard to avoid. Uh, we, we, the reason we do it this way is we try very hard to promote the idea that you should run it as an atomic transaction to produce an image. Because for the most part, that's what people actually want. Um, and most of the time, when they accidentally run those steps independently, they're doing it by accident and not on purpose. And so when you do want to do it, we do give you a way of doing it. It is, it is a thing. It's just not a default workflow for us. Um, because for the most part, what people are doing is they're taking these inputs, they're trying to build something that they want to turn around and use in production. And for a production image, you probably don't want humans stepping in in the middle, doing weird stuff, and then stepping back out and running the next step or rerunning the first step again. Right, so that's why, for us, while we can do it, we, we don't promote it as a default workflow because the vast majority of people are just not particularly interested in it, but it is a thing you can do. So, because MakeOSI was initially envisioned to hack consistently, of course, it had to include some form of uh, caching. So, there's, I guess, three forms. Um, the first is just a package manager cache, like. We choose a directory on desk, and everything gets saved there. Yeah, that's we that. I think we did that yeah. Well. So that's it's pretty straightforward. Then, even if you do that, just the fact of just running DNF to install uh, 300 or 400 packages in itself is slow. Um, so we cache that as well. This is where it becomes harder already. So <laughs> at that point, you have to start saving, uh, or you have to start doing cache invalidation, basically. So um, Makeos, I didn't used to not do it at all. So your uh, cache invalidation was explicit. The uh, user had to specify it when to invalidate the cache. Now we do it a little. So we save the list of packages that gets installed. Um, we save the uh, repositories that are enabled. But Makeos I is extremely flexible when it comes to installing packages. You can provide any package manager configuration file you want, and we will use it. Uh, we do not take all of that up into the cache manifest. So if you change one of those like package manager configuration files, you have to do it explicitly. I think Docker is in a way better, or like containers, I guess, are in a, in a way better at this, because indeed you do get the per step uh, layers that you can, um, that can be cached. Uh, and then I guess the third layer of caching is that we mount a, a build directory in, into when we run the build script for, for systemd. This is basically uh, meson to meson set a build, meson install, meson build, meson install. So we make a build directory available so that the build system of whatever project you're building, which you're hacking on, uh, can use that as its incremental build directory so that you have the third layer of caching uh, of the build itself. And with those three, uh, and if you're not changing settings all over the place, then yes, you get a pretty quick iteration cycle. But the caching is not, uh, it's not safe, I would say. Um, yes, but... You'd be surprised. For, 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 uh, for... No, that is true. But to give another example, at Meta we have a, another image builder, which is called Antler. Um, which integrates very heavily with the build system. So with us, with us this is bug two, um, which basically every step is defined as a build step with a, a hashed output. And so it can very easily figure out exactly which steps have to be rerun and only those and nothing else. So then you get caching that is actually correct uh, instead of just, it will probably work, but if you, it might not. And there's, yeah, there's a difference between the two. Um. About, uh, about the layers, uh, we might allow something similar too. So um, macOS I allows using base trees that get copied in or get an overlay on top and then you only work on top of those. And I've used that for, for a similar layering thing. There's bugs there. Um, they still need fixing, but it, in principle it's possible. And we also have the mode for no distro, where you just bring a pre-prepared tree and there's no package bootstrapping. You just work on top of that. I've never used that, but I think people use it for some things. I think Yocto thingy. Yes, do, you, do you want to? Because I think that your situation is quite different, right? With the cache. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, so the cache, yeah. So, like I said, the manifest the sort of like description of the build process. We have caching, which is 
both at the pipeline and the stage level. So we, you know, we have pipelines that are made up of stages. Does it doesn't really matter exactly, but yeah, the way it works is we the the each stage, each pipeline does have a sort of uh, um, well, an ID, a checksum, right? A checksum of the the options in the stage itself, which is and the content of everything before it. So it's, um, it's at every stage, if you can optionally, optionally checkpoint or not, but like at every stage, the tree is transformed by, uh, by a stage and you can save that tree in the cache. And um, because of the guarantees we make about, about how stages work, that, um, if that hash doesn't change, the content of the tree shouldn't change either. Uh, so it's, it's a very, um, yeah, so we, basically you can, you can cache the, the, the output of the, well, the, the result of each tree, of each, the tree result of each stage and sort of continue from there uh, when, any, when any stage change. And also like, the way the, the way the manifest is structured and the way it's described, it's essentially a graph. And so, like we, the 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 process understands the cross pipeline dependencies. So you can have pipelines that don't depend on other pipelines. You can have like like multiple leaf nodes. Um, and so you 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 can have a situation, for example, where you change a manifest, but it doesn't affect. Uh, it, it'll only affect like the set of pipelines that come after it. So you can. That's basically how the caching works there. Um, uh, does that, does that cover the question? Yeah. So I wanted to actually add one other piece because you're talking about how going backwards and forwards through trees, both of you, Jorgen, and, uh, and I realized uh, that I forgot about that we do, one of the things that Kiwi is also capable of doing is you can extend it with plugins to add either other subcommands or extra functionality and other things like that. Well, we have a plugin called the Stack Build plugin, which allows us to run through each step and cache them and store them as OCI images. And so you can archive them, pull them back down and put them in and run them in independent phases um, with whatever things you'd like to do. Or you can do crazy things in the middle and mutate them again and then archive them then and come them back down and, and do things like that. So um, for us, while it's not a default workflow that you can cache every step in every phase, um, we have a plugin that allows us to do this for the purpose of being able to break things up and pipeline them independently or be able to do something like you have one root tree that you have and you want to produce multiple different types of outputs and they may have small mutations described in the description for each of those types of outputs. So for example, you have a base root tree that makes an OEM disk image and then you also want to turn this into a virtual machine image and then maybe an OCI container uh, or, a, um, or a live media ISO or an install ISO and whatever. But you have a baseline set of content that you can then reuse for all of them. So you can do one of those, stack it, pop it into a registry, pull it back down again later, and then use it to re-input and build the remaining pieces to produce all the different outputs while being able to reuse the bits that you used before. Um, this, again, it to some degree kind of defeats reproducibility because you have not made an atomic transaction anymore, but you get additional flexibility in the form of being able to reuse the trees and speed up your processes. Like, I use this once in a GitLab CI pipeline where we produced the initial root tree for one thing and then we spawned a chain set of separate builds that then ran the second stack to do all the different outputs of an ISO, a disk image, a VM image, a cloud image, and, and things like that, and then be able to push those individual artifacts to their respective upload locations to be able to publish them. So, like, we do have those kinds of capabilities. They're often not necessarily in the core because they're not really a core workflow, but we have plugins and extensions to be able to do stuff like that. To, to be able to do that. Like we have a plugin for hermetic building inside of a virtual machine and things like that um, to enhance people's workflows based on specialized needs and requirements. So a, a question? Yeah. Uh, when I'm listening to you guys, uh, it really sounds like you're trying to rein the, the Nix OS in some way. <laughs> and, and maybe the solution could be the Nix OS without a functional language. So I, would, so I will say specifically that the big difference between NixOS and what, what at least I'm doing, I don't know about what he's doing, but like what, what I'm doing is that 
we don't have static manifests. We have dynamic manifests. We don't version lock anything by default. Most people who are trying to build images do not want version locking because version locking is usually done somewhere else. They're either composing, they have a repository, a locked version repository, or they have inputs that are, that, that are passed in by a build system environment or something like that. They have somewhere else that they're doing their, their content constraints. And, and they want this piece to be able to function essentially independently of that. Or you have regular users or distribution people to do, who absolutely do not want locking and want the content to update as you run the builds over and over again. So that is a separate functional concern. And so we define the properties that we care about, which is being able to say, we know what this stuff should have in it. This is what type of structure the image is gonna look like. And then out on the other end, you're able to say, okay, this, this maps pretty cleanly to that based on the inputs that you sent in. Because our main goal is to be able to integrate into larger systems. So whether you're using a code GPL system environment, which has a defined set of archives and inputs based on its build root environment, or whether you're using an open build service instance, which pulls in content and triggers rebuilds as content changes and does invalidation of inputs and outputs on the regular, or if you have something like GitLab CI, where you have defined inputs and outputs stored through pushing and popping through container registries. Whatever workflow you want to use, you have a way of being able to implement this with the tool because our first goal is to be able to make it easy for humans to understand what it is, but our second goal is also to be able to build into whatever workflow you want to use. So maybe a different way to look at this is that the, the goal is to take uh, RPMs that you already have and the whole distro that you already have and just package in a different format. So, I mean, if our distro was Nixos, then the answer would be yes. But since it's a bunch of RPMs, then the answer is... So I actually had a PR to add Nix support to make OSI. Uh, I pretty much got it to work. It started installing everything in the Nix store, and then we ran into the... Uh, the content store problem. Well, the problem that they don't follow the file system hierarchy standard. Yeah, I'm not saying that they are perfect. No, no, but <laughs> I think for the rest, I think you could very much put someone for Nix here on the podium, and they would be... Uh, I think Nix is a valid image builder uh, yeah. on its own. The problem is that... Uh, because we wanted to use this to add NixOS to the system DCI. We run CI for all the other distributions. We wanted to add Nix as well. The problem is that all the shared infrastructure that we use for the other distributions, like even as simple as putting a service file in user lib system D system, does not work on NixOS. It has to be in the store, uh, which means that you have to do custom fixes for everything with NixOS. So if you're only interested in NixOS, then I think you can, I mean, I, Next, use a system the repart to build its images. Um, so uh, there's a project somewhere. I don't know the name, but uh, it's a value. Of, it's a valid way of building images as well. I don't think it will, like Neil said, work for the RPM base and, and all the other districts without quite some changes, probably. Uh, this is uh, yeah. Everything is straight off in computer science. Okay, lots of questions. So. I think a question for Achilles. Um, would it be possible to take sort of, you know, the knowledge that's in Composer and sort of switch out the bottom layer of it and have it do operations on, instead of like um, on a VM, have it running on the host system that you're running it on? You know, you get your 64K UADs, you make a directory there and you do everything you need there. And then uh, pass it over to systemd repart to actually build the image. Would something like that be possible? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, the, a lot of it, so the, the I guess, well, like I said, like the, the, the knowledge in Composer is, like, the, like I said, like these sort of like prede predetermined pipelines about how to build an image. And yeah, you could, I mean, you can, if you, if you stop a build early, like if you take a manifest that builds a QCAL or a raw image, and then you don't do the raw image part, you're left with an operating system tree in a directory, right? And then, like you said, you can, you can, you can shove that through repart and, 
and get, is that what you're asking? Yeah, so yeah, you could, I mean, the bits are all there. You can do it now if you want. Like, I mean, you, you, can, you can generate an OSBuild manifest, cut off the last bits, and then um, wrap that, or like send that through into a, into a repart and, and get your... Uh, let's talk after this. <laughs> So, uh, a quick comment, or do you... Yeah. Let's go, ahead, go ahead, because we have more questions. I, I don't want to starve people, the audience. So, for what it's worth, you could probably do the same thing with Kiwi 2, because you could, instead telling Kiwi to make the disk image itself, you could just tell it to archive the root tree as a tarball or whatever, and feed it to system to repart and do it that way, if you'd like. It's, I, I actually don't know of an image build tool that doesn't let you just leave you either an OS tree or an archive of the operating system tree that you can then do random stuff to afterwards if you'd want. Uh, this is not a Nick's question, so <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. Um, how easy or hard is it to make a Raspberry Pi image with any of these tools? Uh, well, uh, so one of the philosophies of Kiwi for its image building is that we rely on existing distribution infrastructure for composing the image as much as possible. So that means that we will use the bootloader stuff that they have available. We will use the uh, init RAMFS creation if, if, if that distribution provides it using Drakit. We have very few requirements itself. We mostly require that you have Drakit. We require that you have a package manager that you want to use for your thing if you want a package manager in there. And then on the host, we require that you have a tool to be able to make loops and create uh, and, and do the, make the final image format like with Quemu image or whatever. So for a Raspberry Pi image, it's you tell it that you want the bootloader for the Raspberry Pi, so you probably pull in the package that includes it from your distribution. And then you include the device tree blob package if it's separate or if it's included in there, whatever. Again, depends on your distribution. Um, at least in the Fedora case, you would install U-Boot. You would install the device tree blobs for, for the Raspberry Pi. And then your regular packages for the kernel and, and whatever software you want to include it in. And then you're basically done because all the rest of it will compose by the internal infrastructure that the distribution has. And we just kind of put a guiding hand to seal it up into an image that you can then run. Um, so yeah, we don't include any explicit support for making sure that Raspberry Pi is going to work. I know someone tried it and had issues getting it to work. So MakeOSI will install the bootloader. We support systemd, boot, and grub, and then it will set up the UKI or the non-UKI kernel image and put it all in an ESP. Uh, or, or like the, the, we also support BIOS. Uh, I think we're the only bio, uh, image builder that can install grub without needing root privileges. No, we don't um, need that too. We don't need, we don't need root privileges to install grub. Okay. We only need it to create the disk. Yes. But then you need root. Only for only if we are going to if only if we're using Grub to actually install. If we don't run Grub install, we don't need it. Okay, so forget that. Um, <laughs> but it's still uh, this comes into the philosophy where MakeOSI installs packages, has a few has declarative settings for some things, and then just runs scripts that allow you to do what you want. Um, we don't include explicit support for setting up the Raspberry Pi. So if you wanted to try this, I'm pretty sure you would need you would run probably into problems, and you would probably need to put some hacks in the script because the Raspberry Pi stuff, as far as I know, I think it has UEFI. No, no? you need U-boot to change to UEFI. Okay, yeah, so it would need extra work, yes. Fake UEFI. It pretends to be UEFI, then it will load grub and do the thing. No, no. I, I can delegate to Leonard for this. Leonard only wants to support UEFI, so. <laughs> well. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Yeah, there you go, done. Just works, done. Uh, OSBuild Composer has an image type that is compatible with the, with the Raspberry Pi. Like, we did that already. Um, it was kind of weird. I, I'm going to answer a slightly different question, which is, if it didn't, how much would, would work w would it be to get it to run? And we had, so we have ARM images, like these minimal ARM images that we use for, like, different kinds of SBCs and stuff. Uh, Raspberry Pi just needed a little bit of work to just shove around some EF, like some firmware packages that need to be in the EFI partition or something like that. Yeah, that's the DTB stuff. Yeah. 
And basically, all we needed to do is sort of like figure out which, pack, which files need to go where, and then basically bake that into the image definition, and then we got a Raspberry Pi image. Um, and that sort of like, like, sort of like a peek behind the curtain. I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but I'm, I'm going anyway. <laughs> like the, 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 the sort of like, yeah, I got the mic, it's all mine now. Um, the, situ the situation with like, with like OS build and OS build composer is usually like, so we have all these stages that can do all sorts of stuff. Sometimes you say, like you sort of decide, we want to do this thing, we want to support the Raspberry Pi, for example. What kind of stages do we need that we don't already have, which is like, do we need like a, like, do we need to run sort of like a bootloader setup command that we don't already support? And then you just write a little stage, a little Python script, script that does that. And, and then you sort of like bake that into the definition in OS Build Composer and you have the thing. And it's not the most straightforward workflow, but it, it, it is sort of like a very um, sort of like piecemeal, get your, make a little stage that does a little thing, just imagine it as a little shell script and write it in Python or whatever language and plug it into the modules and you've got your thing. So I guess the one more comment is the more standardized every, every part of this becomes, the easier it becomes to do for everything. That's so, true for all of us. Yes. Yep. So uh, there's like for the, 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 we started the UA, UAPI group a while ago to basically standardize as much of this stuff as possible. Like, but it's, it's not like particularly hard stuff. It's like, where do you look for device trees? Where do you look for an RMFS if there's a pre-built one and all that stuff? And the more of that stuff that's standardized and every distribution just puts all of their stuff in the same location and it really sounds like stupid, but uh, all of that stuff makes it a lot easier for, to build images for any kind of device that supports some standardized firmware like UEFI um, to be able to build images for those that will just work out of the box. So one of the things that uh, has been really important for experimentation and uh, just just general learning about uh, the image build process for me has been composable builds. So I just wanted to get an idea of where where the uh, the tools are in terms of building from multiple files and uh, squashing that into one config. Yeah, I'm answering the question that I got from this. So, uh, if you mean composable builds, earlier we mentioned layering. So, macOS I uh, supports doing base trees. So, you just say this directory is a base and put that on top, and then that. That macOS I does that, um, can put an overlay on it. Uh, Works, works nicely. I've, I've used, it, used it in the past, although it has some bugs, as mentioned earlier. Um. I think you also mean uh, including specific config files depending on profiles and stuff. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So uh, I think we're pretty much the same as Kiwi here when it comes to down to functionality. It's just, it looks different. You can have a, it's, we use any file syntax like the rest of systemd. Um, so you just put a match section at the top and then you have a bunch of conditions and you can select a profile and then you can match on the profile and only conditionally include that specific piece of configuration. Um, this was inspired by Kiwi. <laughs> I saw they had it, so I thought we need to have it too. And that's how it came uh, to be. So we're talking about my tool now, so I guess I should say what, we were, what, it, what it actually is. So to answer the question about the composability thing, so there's two types of composition that exist in Kiwi today. So there's the what I like to call um, horizontal composition, which is you have different file snippets that contain parts of your image description that you can have separated out to either have different maintenance, being owned by different people or being uh, used to be able to be reusable and imported into different base definitions. Then there's um, what I like to call vertical composition, which is you have these profiles definitions that can create an inheritance model where these are all combined together when it is evaluated to create your final image definition. So with, that's the Kiwi profiles feature. So with profiles in Kiwi, you can say, I have this fragment that, has, that is part of this profile. And then I can have another profile that says, I require this profile to be able to make this profile complete. And so when you run the build and say, I want this profile that requires this one, the first profile is then merged into the second as part of the final, uh, the final evaluation and then run together as a unified thing. So that's your, 
the, so we have this horizontal and vertical composition model to be able to make it easy for people to basically break out how their description looks to make it as uh, to fit their management or maintenance model that they would like. Um, particularly, this was introduced into Kiwi originally for Fedora because Fedora used to use kickstarts to build all of its images, and kickstarts can be broken up into vertical, vertic um, horizontally composed files. So you have different kickstart snippet files that then included each other to create ultimately a final uh, kickstart that was a final was the complete definition. And we created this functionality so that these snippets could be reproduced so that the individual special interest groups that maintain their functionality, like different desktops, um, different uh, labs and, and, and purposes, could then be incorporated uh, flexibly into creating a complete definition without everyone, any one person having to figure out all the other pieces to make, make a working image. And so this kind of fits more with, if you have a central repository of image definitions, for very, whatever reason it might be, it might be access control or permissioning or um, tooling con uh, conventions and restrictions, then you can have them have all the different images that are defined in there broken up into pieces that each, each individual group of people that needs to make those images can then maintain them without worrying about accidentally breaking somebody else's stuff. And so that's, that's where the horizontal and vertical composition stuff came into play for, for Kiwi. Um, yeah, um, so I don't think, <laughs> no, but, <laughs> so the way, wait, who, who asked the question, doesn't matter, uh, right, so the way, the, way, the way we define the image now, you can, like, if you squint the right way, turn your head, like, 180 degrees, maybe you can call it composable, like, the way, the way sort of, like, the way we define everything, there's sort of, like, a, a base definition, and we sort of inherit that, but it's all in code, and it's not, I'm not going to say it's ugly, because I wrote a bunch of it. But, <laughs> but we're sort of rethinking, like I, like I mentioned earlier, sort of like the space in between the sort of situation. We're sort of rethinking how we do these things. And, and I don't think we use the term composable build, but it is exactly sort of like how we're thinking about it. Exactly sort of. It is sort of how we're thinking about it, which is, you know, you have these, this like, like, like bare bones definition, which is like, this is a fedora. Right, and, and you sort of, sort of like layer things on top of it, and, and then it becomes a Fedora AMI for EC2, you know? And, and, and then you build on top of that, and it becomes a special flavor of an EC2, and, and, and those sort of things. So we are thinking about things in that way, uh, maybe not in those terms, but it is something that we're very aware of. Because it just makes it easier to reason about the whole thing as well, right? Like it sort of comes naturally, I think, when you're thinking about sort of like the whole space of these uh, image definitions that we want to support. So, um, I'm wondering um, if I wanted to use any of the build tools, could I like build on Art Fedora image or uh, on Debian? Um, yeah, some other distro. Like, what would what are the minimal? How uh, how much cross distro support is there? You can start, and I'll go afterwards. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, I did a lot of work to basically make it work for every distro everywhere. Um, every distro we support, you can build. Not every uh, only OpenSUSE is difficult um, <laughs> because the uh, OpenSUSE does not package apt, so you're kind of out of luck there. But you could, there's still ways around it. So. If you have the tools available, you can use MakeOS anywhere to uh, build any images for any distro you want. But you need the package manager. That's the problem. So what we did, because the package managers are not available everywhere, OpenSUSE does not package apt. So you can build Ubuntu or Debian images on OpenSUSE. Uh, what we did for that is we basically invented the concept of, no, we didn't invent it. No, we did we it before, it yes. But uh, <laughs> what we added was a, a tools tree. So MakeOS can build you an image first. Any distribution that you have the package manager for, and then use that image to build another image. 
So what you do in OpenSUSE is you use a Fedora tools tree, which does have apt available. Uh, and then once that is built um, via, well, mount namespace magic, we basically, for when we run the package manager, we replace, we run it in a sandbox with the Fedora image uh, available instead of the host system. And you suddenly uh, can run apt, and so you can build uh, apt images from, or Debian images from a, a OpenSUSE distribution. And this also, the tools tree also helps with reducing the number of dependencies you need available on the host. So the only thing Python, uh, the only thing MakeOSI needs is Python, bubble wrap, util Linux and core utils. And then that's enough to build a tools tree uh, and the package manager. That's enough to build a tools tree and then you, all the tools come from there and you don't need anything else. There's a question. Okay. The, the mics still with yellow. To very slightly expand the question, also cross arch. So yeah, cross arch works if you have uh, only emulated. So you need QMA user static. Um, the only distro that's good at cross compiling is GAN too, um, <laughs> <laughs> as far as I know. Yeah, De Debian prides itself on that too. I guess yeah, Debian might. Yeah, they're not good at it anyway. <laughs> so the only way we supported this with uh, QMA user static, uh, and that means it slows down a lot. We run, we roll, well, we always run the host package manager, so in native mode, but the problem is the scripts, right? When the uh, kernel uh, post installation script starts running that mod, you're in for a long wait. Uh, it's, it's hard to fix without basically moving everything out of scripts uh, and, and doing more upfront. Because you could also run the native dev modes from those, but the problem is that there you get into arch incompatibilities and stuff. So it's it's a very hard problem. Uh. So we have two ways of doing this in Kiwi. The first way is built in, which is um, if your host environment has the package manager you can you you want, you can use it. So. Out of the gate, we support DNF5, DNF4, yes, they're split out, and uh, as well as um, apt from Debian. We don't support apt RPM. Don't ask me about that. I, I very happily ripped that code out. Um, we also support uh, Pac-Man for Arch-based systems. Um, you can run, you can do split, you can do mixed architecture as well if you have Quima user static. And you can, and it, you can also have a Kiwi description, a complete Kiwi description that's multi-distro. So you can define a unified uh, set of descriptions that can build either for a Fedora target or a Ubuntu target or a Debian target or an Arch target or an OpenSUSE target by reusing the stuff that's the same and making sure your package definitions are, are declared along with the correct profiles for your correct distribution targets. Um, when I, before I went to work for myself, uh, and I do consulting services for Kiwi as well as other things in open source, um, I worked for a company that we implemented this to be able to do simultaneously RHEL, CentOS Stream, and Ubuntu LTS in the same definition with common components, reusable bits, and being able to c pipeline out them and push them and test them all at the same time. Um, the second method is you can use the, what we call the boxed build plugin, which then re-encapsulates everything inside of a virtual machine that's, boot, that's activated unprivileged on your machine. So then you get to remove the privilege requirements on your host by running just Quemu, and then it runs a Fedora universal, uh, VM that we call the universal box, because Fedora is the only distribution that we support that has all the things, and it in includes all the tools that you need for building any image for any target for everything. And so the only things you actually need then are then Quemu, VertIOFS or SSHFS, and then you're able to run a build in that, in that environment, and then it will pop out on the other end an image that you have for this. And for cross-architecture, inside the universal box, we also include the ability to run the emulated for that, or if you're on a different architecture, then we can go the reverse. So if you're on ARM and you want to build an x86 image, that'll also work. Why you would do that, I don't know, but hey, <laughs> more power to you. Uh, so we have, these, we have these different ways of being able to do it. Um, and, and, and that allows us to be very flexible for being able to support those kinds of interesting, crazy use cases. Yeah, so uh, pretty much the same answer. So cross distro, again, if you have the sort of, if you have a way to set up the build route, which usually means the package manager of the target uh, distribution, uh, you can do cross distro. 
um, builds. So, for example, um, yeah, so OS build is packaged on Arch even though we don't build Arch images, but you can use RPM to bootstrap the, the, the build route and then build everything else. I never considered the option you just mentioned, but that would be totally doable, right? If like, yeah. if you, if you, you the, the, the option of like setting up a RPM build route and then using that to set up a secondary build route for the target. That would totally work. And you already sandbox everything, so it should be easy to yeah. replace yeah, exactly. that user, yeah. Right. Um, there's some limitations, of course, because again, we're, we're using bubble wrap, so like you can't build, you, you, can't, you can't build a Fedora ButterFS on RHEL because RHEL, <laughs> because Butter. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Um, so that's it. Cross Arch, no. Um, but if you've seen Bootsy Image Builder in any of the other talks, that does support cross arch builds um, with uh, QMU static, and 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 that's sort of a special case because we didn't really. So cross arch used to come up a lot before, and and we really we really we didn't go much, too much into it because we knew that we would hit a lot of roadblocks with some of the tooling and some of the stages that we run. None of those things that we were kind of wor mostly worried about were relevant for the Bootsy Image Builder case. Uh, so we did it and it worked and it's actually pretty fast. It, like I was kind of surprised how, um, how easy it was. And that, that's all Michael's work. He's sitting right there. <laughs> I just want to add like one problem with the user and the user. So I just want to add one interesting challenge that anyone who's using bubble wrap probably also faced is if you use QMU user and bubble wrap, it, 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 it's not compatible and it, it dies very early and I, I haven't figured it out yet, but if somebody knows more, please talk to me because I would love to figure it out. I won't talk to you later. You might be able to figure that out. So um, one thing that MKSI is very big on, especially in recent times, is having tools that get a tree to work on and doing everything possible from the outside. And this means that, uh, well, it, it, it requires thinking in a different way of how you build the image, but then if the tools support operating on a, um, uh, like with a dash dash root option, then things become nicer because you don't have the tools in the image, the, the image is cleaner. Uh, how, how are we doing on that? So, Kiwi's, de uh, Kiwi's default operation depends on how you define it, whether it's going to operate entirely outside or if it's going to use the in outside to then define a new inside to do the build. So we operate um, within the image definition for, like, say, defining what content goes included. We have three phases. We have the bootstrap phase, which is the native package manager on the host is then used to then populate the route that you're going to work in. We have the image phase, which is then after the bootstrap phase, the package manager that was installed in the bootstrap phase, if you put one in there, then, well, I hope you put one in there because the image phase won't work without it, will then be used to do all the subsequent operations. And then you have, you have optionally, you can use the uninstall phase of, say, if there are some stuff that got put in that you want to take out. Uh, for example, you're making an image that has a desktop and it pulls in via weak dependencies that you have, or weak or strong dependencies that you have X11 for some reason, but you don't need X11, so you remove it afterwards, and so you're left with only a Wayland desktop in the image. So this is what we do for Fedora Sahi Remix, for example. Um, you can do that. And then there's a fourth stage type, which you should really not use, but it's there if you really have to, which is called the erase stage, which, does, which lets you break dependencies and uninstall packages forcefully in the event that you really have no other resort for it. So this is often used for, um, like if you're on really older RPM distributions or Debian distributions where the kernel and the Linux firmware packages were tied to each other and you couldn't actually erase them without removing the kernel and you needed to erase the firmware because you don't need it, like you're making a cloud image uh, or things like that. Now obviously this is a horrible thing and you should never really do this because it makes your final result essentially unusable by a package manager in there. But if you wanted to create an image where you didn't care about any of that stuff and you just only wanted to have um, you just you didn't want to have a package manager in your final image, define all your content in the bootstrap phase because then it uses the host package manager and then stops right after that. But if you if you install systemd boot in Kiwi, where do you run bootkettle install? Uh, it runs from inside, not from outside. 
Uh, the reason for that is that if we run it from outside, then we depend on the host environment to provide all the necessary capabilities to do this. In order for our, the ability to assure that, let's say you start from, say, RHEL 8 or 9, and then you want to boot, build a Fedora image, and you don't want to be coupled to the fact that RHEL doesn't ship SD boot or boot cuddle or any of the other stuff, well, then if you use SD boot in your image definition in Fedora, then you need a boot, boot cuddle that's inside to run it instead. Why don't you install boot in the bootstrap code? Because it has to be the same as the distribution you're building for. Uh, no, because you're still, uh, no. If you're using the bootstrap phase, it's still using the repos of the target distribution you're building for. So you, the bootstrap root is, the bootstrap phase is often used to just set up the repositories and just the file system hierarchy. But if you want to do everything and not have the final image have an, a package manager at the end, you can put all the content, everything that you actually need in your final image in the bootstrap phase. And then all the stuff is there, and then all the subsequent stages. We'll just use the stuff that's inside there, because the bootstrap phase is still installing into the populated root target. It is just, you are using host resources to do it. And the ideal is that you don't do everything that way, but if you are in a case where you want something with no package manager, then that is basically where you have to put everything. So, yeah, like Shabishek said, we, everything we can run from the host or the tools tree, we do. So system has all these fancy tools that have a dash dash root option to operate on a directory instead of on the host system. So we use that as much as possible. Uh, it was mostly Debian that forced us to do it that way because they don't have a dash dash root. Yeah, uh, they do. We, they do now, but they didn't when we were first writing it. Yeah. The only thing we don't do it for is that mod um, for the kernel modules dependency updates because uh, it, it there are uh, dependency uh, sorry version differences. Um, it tends to work, but then for some cases it doesn't. If you run the Fedora that mod on a CentOS image, then it does not get generated correctly, so uh, modules fail to get loaded. So that mod is one you have to run inside the image. And then of course the package manager scriptlets will also try to run various kinds of things inside the image. Uh, kernel install, that mod as well. Uh, I think the OS3 maintainers were working on making a lot of stuff like that more skippable by uh, environment variables and to avoid having to modify the post-install scriptlets, I modified some systemd tools as well to allow skipping their operation. So you can set kernel install bypass equals one and it will not run. Um, we set that when we run DNF so that we can run it, uh, so that we can run, uh, do stuff outside of the image ourselves uh, later on. But it's kind of these very hacky solutions really. Um, we do some of the same things as well for doing fix ups for the final image creation. So ideally, package managers would support this more, or you would be able to tell a package manager there is a tool that's running the package manager that that's, that's going to run a bunch of steps later on to do the same stuff you're already doing in the scriptlets, and that means you could use uh, the native version instead of the uh, architecture version if you're doing a cross arch build, which would help speed things up, but uh, this would be quite a bit of work probably to get all, rid of all the scriptlets uh, or make them optionally skippable. Uh, not sure how to handle that properly, really. Although, although that's something we wish for generally, fewer scriptlets in, in packages across all distros. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. Scriptlets make everything hard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, the same. Like, we, we, we use double dash root wherever we can. Um, we build... We build the, and, and so like everything, you start from the build route, right? You set up the build route, ideally you only do package installation to set up the build route, so like you have everything you're gonna need there. You run, we use, we, we always make sure to use the same content sources, like repositories to set up the build route that we're gonna use for the target image, so you always have the same package versions and tool versions and all that. And I don't know, sometimes, it, sometimes the tool just doesn't let you do a double, it doesn't have a double dash root, so you, you do a CH root. Um, a, a, a big, large number of stages are just writing files, so that's easy, you just write it where it's gonna be, right? Yeah. So yeah, but the, I think the most important thing in this situation is, but a, 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 a really important thing in this situation is, is a version matching the tools. You don't wanna, this, this kinda, I think this happened once or twice. You don't wanna like make a fess a disk with a newer version of, of some kind of tool and then have an unbootable image because the target kernel doesn't support an option that you, 
that you said. Um, but yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's, I don't know if it's actually exactly a question uh, because you should have preempted it a little bit because yeah, with Bootsy Image Builder as well, it feels like these are now becoming two different problem spaces almost. Like one is like building the content and the other one is actually taking that uh, like tree and then making an image out of it. Um, I mean, there are still obviously problems there where like with versioning and then sometimes, yeah, I don't know, like I know LVM for instance is a nightmare to like. Oh my God, you it's so bad. Um, but you know, but those are like sort of things where like problems maybe more for the image building stage rather than like just making the tree stage, right? Like the tree stage is theoretically quote unquote easy. Um, or like, I mean, and, and do you see yourself maybe like as that perhaps becomes standardized, then you sort of drop that more and more from like what you are actually like as, as a thing that you're doing and developing your tool for as in like your tool makes trees rather and then more focus on sort of no this tool makes the image out of a tree and where the tree comes from yeah we can generate one for you but we can also take take any tree or any um does, does that make sense because like, I wonder, for instance, we, we, like, there, there's an image builder, now there's Bootsy image builder, which takes sort of like this Bootsy container and it makes a bootable image out of it. But I wonder if there's a point where like, you just take a tree, a tarball, a container, whatever, and you make anything out of it. You make, you know, like it, it, it can be, uh, it doesn't have to be a West tree inside of a container. Like you, you don't really care. It's just you make all of the images, whatever you want for whatever platform in it with whatever file system you want on it and whatever. I mean, I know there's versioning constraints there, but I'm sure you could standardize that in some way that like, do I have the capabilities to do that in the, the final thing, and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think of the two uh, of us, I think the tool I work on is the oldest. So um, I can actually say with, uh, even with rewrite, I think we're the oldest. started at the same time. Oh, okay. Um, so, okay, there is a point that it was originally written in Perl and then rewritten into Python because Perl sucks, but that's a whole other separate thing. But over the time that Kiwi has existed and evolved, we used to do more and now we do less. And that is because over time that the stuff that we've needed to do to compose a final image that actually works has been able to move into the respective parts that are part of the distribution. And this kind of goes in time with the, the philosophy Kiwi has is that we want to rely as much on the distribution infrastructure to be able to produce the image correctly because we can't know everything that is needed for a distribution image to be made. We can only know enough to be able to call the right things that hopefully produce the right outputs that we can then consume to seal it up. In, in many respects, we're kind of already on that trajectory. Um, but I think that we're probably never going to see an image build tool default to a workflow where you have to provide it a pre-prepared tree because for the most part, no, but people don't know how to make trees and that, and like, that's really an expert level step. And yes, the Bootsy stuff is kind of one of these things, but I actually expect that opinionated or really successful invocations of using the bootable container path will also have the tool create the container and not tell you that it's making one. Uh, because it, it really is uh, an implementation detail of producing the final artifact that is what you actually care about. And I expect that over time what we're gonna see is hopefully, especially with the UAPI group and image build tools like Kiwi, Mako SI, and others actually getting involved in trying to get more of these little fugly pieces like kind of standardized in a way that we can just predict them that we can actually start doing less and less. Like I can tell you that from one of the, the ugliest things is to figure out how to write, uh, how to correctly write out the uh, FS tab file. Uh, because the distributions have different policies around how they're supposed to be sorted, how they're supposed to be oriented, what's the formatting of it, what's the, what's the labeling convention, what features are supported within this stuff. And, and, it, and while it is just a file, right, and it's supposed to be easy to write a file, the capabilities of each individual distribution and the amount of probing that has to be done to make sure that the right settings are in place is stupidly high. It's a lot of work. Um, things like the systemd auto mounts and stuff like that are actually quite useful for being able to abstract that stuff, but we're not yet at a point where we can say that there's a common baseline of features for all the different things that people can, that we can rely on as image build tools to make, our, to make it easy to produce those artifacts in, in a, 
um, way that you would say, oh, this tool is just wrapping everything up and making it tied in a bow and ready to go. I just have one, okay. don't mind, one point of clarification. Um, for, for Bootsy, the Nexus is not creating an image. The Nexus is an update. Being able to switch the content of an existing system to another tree, essentially. So no, no, nothing what you said there is wrong, except for, um, as Sana points out, the fact that there will be a tree to generate an image from is a fundamental in that world. Um, and you know, the creation of, of bootable artifacts is, is a single step in the life cycle where you'll m very often do an update or an iteration or other things like that. At least that's how it's conceived. What, what I wanted to add with, to that, uh, well, the, the keynote this morning inspired me to that make OSI should just support downloading an OCI image from somewhere and turning it into a bootable image, yes. Uh, you can already give it a random tree. So we have a base trees option. You give it a tree and uh, build takes OCI images already, so we can already do that. We do a few item potent operations. We run that always, but otherwise, if you don't define any extra packages to install or whatever, we will just take that tree as is, go through the steps, don't really do anything, and then eventually end up at the packaging stage where you package it up in whatever format you want. If you already have a tree, you don't really need to ma use makers. I just use systemd repart directly to package it up. So we can already split those two, for at least for disk images. Uh, I mean, you already have tar or whatever. Like, if you have a tree, you can invoke those directly. In a way, like there are like uh, there is a, a, a little bit of like uh, you need extra options for tar to include X headers and stuff like that. So there is a little bit of like complexity in there that uh, makes it hard to just invoke the individual tools. Like repart also needs a bunch of options added. Uh, but you could theoretically look at macros. I just copy the report command line and run it yourself, and you'd get the same result. Yeah, what what we don't do there in report is all all the fancy cloud images that yeah, the, the that is that, that is stuff I don't know, and I think Dan doesn't either. I know them, but that's still not part of what report is doing. Yeah. We forgot about Zipper. Oh, now now it's working. Yes. Uh, so yes, I mean, MacOSI supports Zipper and Kiwi supports Zipper. Right? I mean, natively. So, uh, of course, yes. Uh, with the scriptlets uh, and those build also, right? I mean, it's we don't have we don't have Zipper support. We don't have Zipper. Oh. Well, we never added it. We ha we have well RPM RPM and Pacman. Uh, we don't need. Yeah, but I mean, it's a stage. You. It's not. I mean, it's it's similar enough that I think yeah. support is not a big deal. I think um, with the scriptlets, there there was a meeting yesterday of the like RPM interested folks, and we have an agreement in principle to nuke uh, the scriptlets used to add uh, users in packages in Fedora. So maybe another thousand scriptlets to go, um, uh, and. Uh, Final thing I wanted to add is that with the like the, with the uh, external tools working on images uh, on a tree, we get rid of the um, uh, architecture dependency, right? And then in principle, if we didn't, if we get rid of all the scriptlets and all the tools support cross uh, architecture operation or architecture independent, then we can actually build a non-native image very very cleanly. Maybe it will happen at some point, I, I hope. Um, That's a lot of ifs. So we're, we're like one minute out. So um, I think there's clear potential for collaboration uh, on the tools, on the formats, on the uh, definitions, right? Uh, any, any final comments? Uh, I guess I want to thank the other image tools for existing because they <laughs> inspired a lot of stuff in Make OSI. Uh, that's it. Yeah, I got nothing. It's it, it, this. It, it's has been fun. Like uh, it, it's nice having this uh, this particular type of panel to talk about all our different perspectives on these things. 
I'm sure a few people uh, got interesting chuckles or, 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 or had you know, bouts of rage from some of our comments, but you know, it'll be fine. Uh, we're, we're all doing interesting things and we have all of it, uh, a different, little different way of doing stuff. And hopefully that helps us all make uh, a better Linux ecosystem. Yeah, I think I think my final thought is is, is that like it, it's it, 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 it's very easy, especially like like when we're talking here. It's very easy to get get tri tripped up on like differences in in technologies and like approaches and things. But I, I don't find that very interesting. I, I find most interesting like sort of like the differences in sort of philosophy. So like what is what should an image building tool do? What shouldn't it do? What should it care about? Sort of the the, the Maybe philosophy is the wrong word, but I think I think everyone understands what I mean. Like sort of the the idea of of what what should an image building tool do? What should we enable? And then how do we how does that adapt to things like Bootsy coming along and sort of like appending the the idea of what an image is and what the lifetime of a system looks like? And I think those are the interesting discussions. Like I mean, this is this was this was it's certainly really interesting. Like talking about, it. yeah, everyone learns something, and um, and I, I don't know. I think I really enjoy these sort of like higher level um, conversations, not about the, the 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 specifics of the technology, but mostly about like what do we, how do we think about it? Like how do we how do we define images? How do we define the build process? How do we think about the build process? I don't think I have much to add now. This was nice. I learned something about Kiwi and about OS Builder. OS Builder I didn't know before. So, this was nice. We should do it again.